Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Phyllis Sarkaria. Uh, I will tell you all about her in just a moment. Uh, Grace Under Pressure is that show that deals with what we often call the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment, the compassion we exert for others. And when you do it as a leader, and you will discover very much that Phyllis is, you do it for to bring people together for common cause and the betterment of the uh, culture. Anyway, so welcome, Phyllis Sarkaria. So, Thank you so much, John. It is such a pleasure to be with you. Great. I want to tell folks about you. Phyllis Sarkaria is a certified master coach, facilitator, and I like this, trusted advisor. Uh, she's held many executive roles in government affairs, human resources, and um, in business development. She's uh, led a multi-million dollar system and implementation, which is way, way over my head. Uh, and she works a lot with R&D. Her new book is called Courageous Clarity, Navigating the Way Forward on Your Leadership Journey. And it's an essential guide for leaders who want to inspire, influence, and engage their teams for better results. Uh, you are a real scholar in the area of, uh, of um, excuse me, scholar of leadership because you've studied it at Claremont, in addition to your MBA and accountancy degrees. So you are something special. Welcome, Phyllis. Well, thank you. I, it's always embarrassing to have someone read your bio. <laughs> well, don't no, be. You, no. I'm a you, small town girl. <laughs> uh, you don't need to be embarrassed because you have a lot. So, um, Courageous Clarity, I love that name. So, what led you to that title and why did you write a book with that title? So, well, it's so it's interesting because I started with the working title of MAP, M A P, which was an acronym that went into sort of exploring the leadership journey. And several of my early reviewers were like, yeah, that's, that's a working title, right? And so I realized, okay, MAP is not going to work. But I started thinking about what does it take to, to really uh, explore yourself? And, and I sort of evolved MAP to GPS because let's face it, maps are static and GPS is more dynamic. It helps you know where you are. It gives you different paths to get where you wanna go. And if you change direction or you get lost, it recalculates. And so there is, there's kind of the model within the book of GPS, but then thinking about what's the right title for this book, I started sort of kicking ideas around with a few people and recognized that, especially for leaders who've been successful, to continue to be successful, but recognize that change is necessary as they progress in organizations, absolutely takes courage. It also takes humility, which is not in the title. Um, but getting clear on sort of where you are, where you're getting in your own way and where you wanna go makes a big difference. And that's how we ended up with Courageous Clarity. Great. Well, you have a very interesting description. Go ahead and hold up the book because I think it's a lovely cover. Um, lovely cover. Courageous Clarity. And it has the yellow and the blue. So in solidarity with um, our neighbors in Ukraine. So that's cool. Yes. Way to go. Um, Anyway, so in the description of the book, you say that businesses um, get to be successful and they achieve the results, but something happens. Um, leadership falls by the wayside. What drew you to that conclusion, uh, Phyllis? I started sensing a, a pattern in many of the executives that I was coaching. And so I'd spent, as you described in my bio, I've spent more than 30 years in corporate America. And for the past five years or so, I've been out on my own consulting and coaching. And um, in working with executives, both during the time that I was in corporations, but also definitely in my coaching practice, I started to see patterns where in particular, successful individuals would get to a point where they're still doing the same things and yet getting, not getting the results they've been getting in the past. Right. And I recognized that there were some insights here that might be worth capturing and putting down on paper, if for no other reason than I could hand each of my clients sort of, here's a workbook, um, and sort of evolved from there. 
but it's this idea of, you know, organizations reward us for having answers. We grow up, you know, in school, we have answers. And, and even in my own, um, you know, as a, a young person growing up and early in my career, it's, you know, be smart, have answers, speak up, be confident. And all of those things are important. But when it's your only tool, and you overuse it, it's going to get in your way of being effective. Well, that's the classic. We have one tool and it's a hammer and we use it very well. And that's, but in, in fairness, because I, I, I was interested in the way you described some of your clients is sort of my interpretation. They're losing their way. And I don't know that they lost it purposely, but maybe they, they focus too much on the work and less on the people. Did you discover that uh, aspect? That's, it's a sense of, I don't want to be too dramatic, but like a loss of humanity. Because in being so focused on results, you kind of lose that sense of it's, you know, um, the great American poet, Maya Angelou, was right. How you make people feel matters. And often as leaders, we, we forget that we can't control how people feel about things, but we can control how we show up, how we interact with them, whether or not we listen to them, invite them to the table, or whether it's just, you know, direction all the time. That is so true. And, you know, we, we do not control events. Um, it's, we only control how we react to it. And so your book is divided into three key sections and we'll take them one at a time, page by page, uh, Phyllis. <laughs> no, we're going to do uh, self-awareness, trust and influence. So, and I think you need self-awareness, influence and trust if you're going to connect effectively. So tell me what you learned about self-awareness. Our friend Tasha uh, Urich says it's real hard to uh, discover. So what, what, are you, what have you discovered, Phyllis? So. Well, I've discovered that it's, it can be, maybe it is the most important skill for a leader to have, to understand how you're impacting people around you. And until you're willing to exercise the humility and the curiosity to find out. Um, for some leaders, that comes through a formal 360-degree feedback instrument. But even if it's not in a formal sense, being willing to both inquire of yourself, why do I do the things that I do? Why am I reacting that way? Um, so have that personal curiosity but also engage with members of your team or colleagues to say, you know, how did I do? What would you like to see me do differently? And, you know, and, and that, I'm glad you have the, I, the concept of cor cor courage in your title, Courageous Clarity, because I think, or you tell me, I, uh, doesn't it take courage to be wholly self aware or seek to learn about oneself? So. Oh, Absolutely. In fact, one of my favorite clients over the years, brilliant guy, number two um, leader in his organization. And one of the things we worked on was this idea of, you know, as humans, we are often programmed because we've been rewarded for so long to tell. And yet asking and listening can be such valuable skills. And so we talked about how he was perceived by others as filibustering. He would go into meetings and just talk, 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 talk. And everyone saw him as he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. And he may very well be, but no one else needs to know that. <laughs> and his sure. initial reaction was really one of, I mean, he was wounded in many respects and felt like people will, will lose confidence in me if I don't come in with the answers. Right. So how did you, and without dis, discovering and just uh, giving up any confidences, how did you get him to understand this? Because it's not an uncommon problem, particularly among highly successful male executives. So Absolutely. And, and I would say even with female executives, often when people have been really successful, that, that success almost starts to get in their way. And so working on the humility and really getting to what did he want to accomplish? How did he want to show up for his team? How did he want to be perceived by his colleagues? As we started to explore that, then it became more apparent that he wanted their insight. He wanted, you know, 
he wanted to be admired and, and supported, but he also wanted to partner with them and collaborate with them better. All right. And I think that leads to another point, which you've, we've been skating around, and that's knowing one's own limitations. And if you are a senior person and you're whom people rely on, and then perhaps our own self est estimation is everybody's relying on me, maybe in, you know, to a, a degree not warranted, um, how do you deal with limitations? So. Yeah. Well, how do you make, how do you make your team stronger by hiring people who are even smarter than you? And getting comfortable with that and, and getting comfortable with and encouraging people to challenge you and do it in a productive way. Right. So that's, yeah, and that's, you know, that is so, ob well, <laughs> to me, that's leadership 101 um, because we live in that world, but it's not always readily apparent, particularly depends on how one has been, quote, met, brought up in management, uh, because I'm guessing that this individual you're describing probably had command and grew up in a command and control system. And, mm -hmm. and so that was his introduction am i uh, true on that so absolutely and the culture of the organization really matters too right. because in many organizations there is this expectation that you know it's sort of the boss the boss's word is the word right. and no one challenges it and so unless you have a leader who actively creates an environment where there can be productive discourse and that's and so you you explore something that um, we could laugh at, but we won't because it's actually the human truth, and that's feelings. <laughs> so, um, how do you get someone to focus that other people, if if one is self absorbed and not maliciously, but to consider reactions of others around them? Do you do it through three sixty, or do you have other uh, ways, Phyllis? So. Well, there's not just one way because, of course, every person is a little different. Um, assessment tools are useful to provide some insight. Mm -hmm. um, I also find that just questions that I ask to get them thinking differently can be helpful because often it's the story they've told themselves and they're just acting on that. And so they will play back to me a certain situation and they're just definitive about what happened or the conclusions they've drawn. And uh, stop on that because we hear that term, the story they've told themselves. What do, what do you mean when you say that uh, uh, explicitly? So. so I'm talking about conclusions that have been drawn probably based on experience, um, you know, prior interactions either with the same people or with similar people. And is, does that lead to um, Phyllis walks into the room and I size her up immediately? Yeah, she's coming in to do this and I don't even hear what she's going to say. So, yeah. Or yeah. Phyllis reminds me of someone I used to know who was very difficult. So Phyllis is probably very difficult, too. <laughs> oh, that's even that's even better, you know, and, you know, it, it comes down to something which is fundamental, but it, it's respect. And and I don't and again, I'm using overly using this term. I think we draw. I know I do uh, draw assumptions about people and I go on record. Generally, my first assumptions are wrong. <laughs> and so when it so it gets down to the concept of respect, I mean, looking at someone with an open heart, Maybe you call it benefit of the doubt, but prove oneself first. Do you, do you find that, Phyllis? So, yes, it's the so I will ask them and encourage them to ask themselves. The more certain you are of something, the question is, what if that's not true? How does but that? But it's change? always true, Phyllis. <laughs> <laughs> but what if it's not? So let's talk about if that's not true how things need to be done differently. Uh, and, and that's a really good question. It's very obvious. And I don't mean, I'm not being facetious when I say that. It's the question that needs to be asked. So do um, say a, a more um, authoritarian type, and I don't, again, I don't mean malign, but feeling that he or she must exert himself all the time. They take that as a challenge, correct? So. Oh, absolutely. In fact, particularly people who've been very much command and control, um, 
it's it may surprise those at lower levels to understand that sometimes that's based on them not feeling safe. So when oh, there yeah. seems to be that lack of humility, that they're very directive, they're not feeling safe, and they to make themselves feel safe, they take control. And so sometimes my job as their coach is to find ways to help them kind of unpack. I'm not talking about therapy, but unpack the triggers for them that set off certain emotions and how they can better manage their emotions rather than have their emotions take over for them. And that's, that's a powerful thought because so often people who do act in a uh, command and control way, it's really um, a kind of a self-protection because it's a being de they're defensive without recognizing being defensive and they turn people off. <laughs> that's the problem. Absolutely. So it gets to the next topic, and it's emotions. You argue that emotions are not to be discounted, but integrated into the way we are. So, but sometimes do we say, and I see that hear this all the time, sadly, about women. She is too emotional, or she doesn't understand. I mean, she's always um, this or that, and it's it's pejorative. So, how do we guard against that, or how do we deal with that, fellows? So. so the emotions are there whether we recognize them or not. Mm -hmm. And if they get tamped down, they typically will come out in unproductive ways. And so one of the biggest challenges, and, and this was true for me early in my career as a leader, because I was, you know, I was all business. I wanted to be taken seriously. So I had to be all business. Oh. And you come across more as a robot when you don't, when you don't care and respect and essentially have empathy. And I also, too, when I get serious, I, I almost look upset. And so <laughs> I really had to work on that myself. Um, well, we're in the hour of confession, Phyllis. So <laughs> let me let me explore this because I haven't had a person come on this show and uh, be <laughs> talk about this, but we always coach around it. So when you were exerting yourself as being strong, whatever, it, Tell you weren't you show. I'm guessing you weren't trying to be uncaring. You simply didn't want to show it. Is that correct? Or is that exactly. I thought that to be effective, and it was also sort of the work environment that I'd grown up in, and you know, coming up through the '80s when women were still making their way in the workplace, particularly in Texas, uh, which is where I started my career. That you had to be not just as tough as the guys, but tougher. If you want, and we know what adjective you would be described to certain women like that. So, yes, yeah. and so the problem with that is if if people don't know you well, then they can easily assume ill intent. Absolutely, absolutely. And you said something which is great because I've coached around this, and you said that your face would become severe. So, I know you've coached people in that area. So, what do you tell them? Sometimes it's, well, actually where I go is the question of, do you know how you're coming across? And encouraging them to pay more attention to facial expressions. So they're nonverbal expressions, what's being portrayed. And what I've learned for myself, because after so many years of habit, still, if I get really intense on something, I can look kind of upset. Mm -hmm. And so what I've learned is sometimes I need to speak up. I need to not just have a good intention, but to share it so that I can't assume that the person that I'm interacting with understands what I'm feeling or that I'm reacting to their feelings yeah. in a way that's positive. Uh, no, I like that because we, uh, so it, it's the simple tells. It's our body language, our gestures, and our facial expression. And um, I once coached a person who was actually very affable and, and by nature a teacher, but he, and he was new to the organization and he had a very severe uh, natural uh, countenance. And so he scared people. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, though I told him just practice in the mirror, or, you know, what that, that kind of thing. And I think it worked. And so, um, but that's, I'm glad you touched on this. So all of this, we lead to something which is essential because, and without it, there cannot, cannot be leadership and it cannot be effective. And that's 
trust. So, um, and you talk about trust being a connection. What did you mean by that, Phyllis? So. Well, it's, it's difficult to have trust if you don't have some kind of connection with people. And in sales, it's typically talked about as frequency of, of contact and impeccable follow through so that you're interacting with someone on a regular basis and you are reliable and credible in your interactions. But where I go with trust is it goes beyond that because it does include the importance of care and respect. And even if you don't like someone, that you respect them as a human being. And finally, that they understand your intentions in the connection, in the interactions, because often we have good intentions, but we don't make them clear. And if there's any doubt in someone's mind, this gets back to someone may just look at you and say, oh, that reminds me of so-and-so, and I didn't like that person. And so they, they start acting on the stories. And often we, that takes us down a path of interaction that's not productive. Whereas if we can be clear on our intentions so that people know what our motives are, they know, you know this is not just about me, that I'm here for you. I'm here to support you. And my actions support that as well. That really and, and that leads us, I think, which is a, a fundamental to leadership. And I touched on it, I think, in, at the show, which is bring people together. So why do we do, other than being clever phrase, why do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> An opportunity to get to know one another. I mean, we found even, even during the pandemic, how important it was to have sort of virtual meetups so that people could speak with one another and not just always about work. And it might be a, a good friend of mine um, with one of his clients, he does what he called, he wanted to call it sort of the Friday happy hour and the group decided they wanted instead to make it kind of magic Monday. So they would have a 15 minute get together and the week before, one person in the group would pick a topic and it might be a great book you've read recently, a movie, you know, some topic that had nothing to do with work. And then they would all get on and share. And it was just a way to kind of lighten things up because they were being very intense and serious with the business. But it, brought now, in it raises a, okay. We were doing that virtually. Do you see that extending now that we're either hybrid or more face to face. What, what's your perception of that, Phyllis? So I hope that people will continue will be intent continue to be intentional about connection, because even though it was it was something that we needed to be more intentional about when we had to be physically separated, you know we know that a lot of groups are still working remotely or in a hybrid fashion, and so there's still that need for connection when you don't have the opportunity to run into one another, you know, in the break room or the water cooler or in the bathroom or wherever, and just have a little, you know, just how are things going? Oh, you know, I heard your son won a soccer game. You know, you got a new puppy, whatever the conversation might be that creates connections for people. That's a great idea. Now, we're um, uh, there's another key topic to your book of uh, courageous clarity, which is influence, which is an outflow from trust, of course. And you touched on this before, but I think it's something we don't talk enough about leadership, and I'm glad that you raise it. And it's curiosity. Why is it important to be curious, uh, Phyllis? Well, I know you have grandkids and sometimes that curiosity can drive you crazy, but from an adult standpoint. <laughs> well, it is interesting how, I mean, kids ask a lot of questions and some somewhere along the way, it's like we decide as we grow up, it's more important to have answers than questions. But if you think about it, the more dynamic and complex the world is, the more valuable curious questions are because answers are really static. And yet, if you think like a scientist where you're, discovering new data, more evidence. And so the answer can always evolve as additional information comes to light. When we're curious, I mean, curious about ourselves, as well as curiosity that helps others grow, it can be really beneficial to those connections we were talking about.
I like how you do that. Is is children have? I have two grandkids myself, and the questions ones two pre-verbal or as the, his three and a half year old brother says, "Grandma, he has no words." So, <laughs> so and, but he is curious. But in a different. But you're right. Children do ask questions, and we not, uh, need that. And I liked how you said answers are static, and. I don't think anything in life can really stay static. And so that's a good tell. I, uh, Phyllis, expand on that. So, yeah. Well, it, if you want to think about it, it's like, are you who you used to be? It's, you know, we're constantly evolving and changing all the time. And, mm -hmm. and I've had clients say to me, oh, I, you know, I'm too old to change. But the reality, you're breathing. Gravity is working on your body. You know, you're changing. Oh, it's working. You or not. <laughs> and sometimes we act as if others are the sum of their past beliefs and actions, if you will, that nothing's been added, subtracted, or evolved. Yeah. But the reality is that each of us is changing every day in some way. Now, you say something which is the obvious. And I, I, again, it's it's so obvious we'd forget it. But if, if one wants to have influence, we have to listen. How did you come to that conclusion, Phyllis? <laughs> well, I credit my grandmother who used to have the old saying, you know, we've got two ears and one mouth for one a reason and use them in that proportion. Um, but I actually, I first learned this when I was working as a regulatory lobbyist. So several decades ago, early in my career, I spent about 10 years working as a regulatory lobbyist in the energy industry. And early on, you know, I was in that mode of, I have to have the answers. I need to be really persuasive. And I wasn't being as effective because the role of the lobbyist is to identify, you know, I'm advocating for a corporation. I need to identify who's likely to support me who's likely to oppose me and how do I get stronger support? How do I get the people to oppose me either on board or at least maybe dampen their opposition? Okay. Right. And if you don't know what really matters to them, you can't put your arguments in terms that are gonna resonate with them. Uh, it's so true. It looks good on paper, sounds okay when I say it to myself, but have you spent time listening? And that's such an obvious thing, but I find, and maybe you do, um, people are just, I'm too busy to listen. Do you, is that one of our flaws, um, Phyllis? So. Oh, absolutely. One of my favorite cartoons, and you've probably seen this, is a guy standing with a bicycle tire, you know, a wheel, and his friend is on a bicycle with square wheels, and and he's offering it to him, and the guy says, no, no, I'm too busy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good. Good description. And it kind of, descri kind of describes this all, or at least me, in, in too many situations. So, um, Phyllis, I could keep going and going with you because you have such a, you're a font of wisdom, and I love your perspective on bringing things out in your book, Courageous Clarity. Do you have a, a story about grace that you wish to share with us? So. You know, I, I love that you touch on grace and that, you know, it's the focus, uh, John, of, of your book and, and a lot of the work that you do, because the lyric to actually Amazing Grace comes to mind when I think about it. That it's his grace that brought me safe this far and grace will lead me home because I get to do work every day that I love. And it came out of kind of a point in my career it sort of evolved from where I was feeling a bit adrift, both in my work and my life. Mm -hmm. And I had an opportunity to do a rotation through human resources. And the intention was you're going to do this for a few years and then you'll go into operations. And working in human resources, I found work that I love because of the magic that happens when you solve business problems and do the right thing by people you can, you know, just amazing things happen. And that was when I decided to pursue that, you know, a career, a further career in human resources, as well as then going into coaching. That's such a good story. And you have such a good background because you were um, a, a biz person steeped in that. And then you uh, fell in love with HR. I think you're the only person that ever did that in the history of humanity. Uh, but no, but you saw the potential of people and things don't happen unless we engage our people. So what a, that's a wonderful story of grace. So um, Phyllis, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show today and talk about your book, Courageous Clarity. Um, how can people find you? So, 
Um, well, thank you for having me, John. And uh, folks can find me, learn more about the work that I do on my website, sarkariagroup.com. And that's spelled S as in Sam, A-R-K-A-R-I-A-G-R-O-U-P.com. Great. And we will put that in the notes. Phyllis, it's been a treat to have you on the show. And with that, we'll close out. Thanks so much.